Uh, my name is Jeffrey, and um, just in short, if you don't know who I am, I graduated from Leiden University in 2017, and my dissertation was titled Buddhist Astrology and Astral Magic in the Tang Dynasty. So the figure that I'm going to speak about today, Yixing, um, is a major part of that study, and I've already published um, some materials about his biography and the texts attributed to him. So, Yixing is probably best known for his activities in three fields of Buddhism. The first is Chan, also known as Zen Buddhism. In the Vinaya, he's less well known for, but there are various texts that are attributed to him, commentaries on the Vinaya, as well as Mantrayana, otherwise called Mijiao, or Mikyo in Japanese, and esoteric Buddhism, later known as Vajrayana. Um, so he assisted the Indian monk Shubhakara Simpa in translating the Da Erjing, also known as the Mahavarochana Sutra in modern English, but the original Sanskrit title was Varochana Abhisambodhan. So, and then he also helped produce a commentary on this text. And so he's very well known for this, especially in Japan, and the Buddhist world remembers him primarily for his activities in these fields. But secular sources, on the other hand, remember him as an astronomer. One thing, though, I've in insisted on distinguishing is a historical Ishing. This is an objectively existent historical figure um, and a pseudo Ishing, which is, in other words, a legendary figure that developed long after he was died. So the real Ishing was a Buddhist monk, and he was an astronomer. And we have various texts uh, that record both of his careers. Uh, and then there's also a lot of stories that emerged, particularly in the ninth century, about Yixing. And these are legendary, miraculous stories. And I don't, as a historian, take them as objectively factual, although some historians, even in recent decades, have done so. And I think we need to rethink how we approach these sources, because there's a difference between historical facts, as best as we can reconstruct them, and religious hagiography. But I want to talk about Yixing the astronomer today. Uh, incidentally, this is a portrait of Yixing that's preserved in the Nara National Museum in Japan. And uh, it's one of the few color portraits we have of the monk from the medieval period. But in any case, the primary sources that we need to reconstruct the history of Yixing the astronomer are texts like the Tongdian. And this is a kind of underappreciated source um, in Chinese historiography, I feel. Uh, Joseph Needham also was aware of this source, but when he did cite it, I think that he was he was reading it too quickly, or his assistant was reading it too quickly, because as we'll discuss later, there's some quite, there's some things about it that I think that he misread. There's also a biography of Yixing in the Zhou Tang Shu, uh, amongst a few other monks such as Xuan Zhang, uh, but then his biography disappears in the Xin Tang Shu. So as you know, the history of the, of the Tang histories, there's the, there's the first history of the Tang dynasty, and it doesn't have this anti-Buddhist bias. And then the subsequent Xin Tang Shu is a reformed version of the Tang history, and it completely dropped Yixing's biography. But fortunately for us, Xin Tang Shu actually provides a lot of information about Yixing's astronomical knowledge, his technology that he developed. And so it's a very critical source in this respect. So briefly, he arrived in the capital in the year 717, and the Zhou Tangshu report said in 721, solar eclipses were not being accurately predicted. And so the court summoned him, and they requested him to produce a new calendar. But we run into a problem here. Where did Yixing learn mathematical astronomy? It's a very puzzling question. And there are later stories that are recorded, such as in the Zhou Tangshu and other sources, that says that he went to temples like Tian Tai Shan and he learned mathematical astronomy, or mathematics anyways, from a monk there. However, there's no names given, there's no dates, and unfortunately, well, I should say unfortunately, but there is a miracle story at the end where the monk predicts that, you know, when my true disciple arrives, the stream outside will turn the opposite direction. And sure enough, after Yixing comes and masters the mathematics, the water in the stream turns the opposite direction. So again, this is not an objectively historical account. And in my estimation, judging from what we can read in the histories, Yixing was probably um, a brilliant mind. Um, 
He seems to have had a photographic memory. So he could have actually learned enough on his own. And in his childhood, he might have also studied and mastered mathematics as well. So he was not just a very brilliant Buddhist thinker, and he could also assist Shubhakara Simha in translating um, you know, a very large text on a new field of Buddhist practice, but he also learned mathematics. Now, um, the Zhou Tangshu and the Xin Tangshu also record some of the um, sentences um, in his own writings about, about how he was going to reform the calendar. And he says, now if we seek to create a calendar and establish an epoch, we must first understand the movements of the ecliptic. I request that the Grand Scribe order the measurements be taken of sidereal parameters. Um, now, most people in Buddhist studies don't know what um, a lot of this astronomy means. Unfortunately, this doesn't show up very well. Can we turn the light off, actually? Let's see if we can turn the light off. Oh, that's better. So basically, the ecliptic, Huang Tao, um, is the band of space representing the annual movement of the sun. So, of course, you can't see it so well, but this is the ecliptic, and this is the celestial equator. And the Chinese were aware that um, these are different lines you can draw on the sky, but the, the issue is, is that the ecliptic, which is actually the plane of the solar system from our perspective, and that's where you will always find the planets. The, the planets never deviate from the ecliptic. But the problem is that the ecliptic actually moves back and forth over the course of the Earth's rotation. And so from a geocentric perspective, you have to keep track of the ecliptic. And that actually requires a good deal of mathematics. And if you're going to attempt to um, measure this, then you have to uh, take into consideration a lot of new mathematical parameters. So Yixing was the first one in Chinese astronomy to propose this. Um, but how, how, is we, well, how is he going to do this? Well, he actually built a new armillary sphere. And so it's a contraption of multiple, multiple rings that are attached together that represent the movements of the heavens. And so he proposed that they build this new device, but he didn't want to deviate from the past. So he said that during antiquity, there existed the technique for an ecliptical armillary sphere, but such a device did not exist. Ancients pondered it, but they could never achieve it. Now, Ling Zan's creation has the solar path and moon intersect so that they always naturally line up. This is especially important for calculations, and I request that a casting be made of bronze and iron. So this is, by the standards of the time, a highly technical, technologically advanced project. And so they had to build this new technological apparatus to measure the positions of the planets relative to uh, uh, the ecliptic and the celestial equator. And he used this when he was designing his calendar. So Yixing's calendar was called Da Yan Li, and it was officially adopted in 729. Um, now the Da Yan is a mathematical principle that's derived from the I Ching, also known in English as I Ching. But the I Ching, is, of course, as we all know, is a divination model. But there's a lot of mathematics that are attached to this text. And so um, Yixing was very much interested in the I Ching, and there's actually some texts, whether they really were written by him or not, are attributed to him. So, as we know, though, he was very much interested in this subject. Um, as to the actual practical, ap like practical ap um, application of applying this traditional Chinese numerology to calendrical science, um, a senior Shingon scholar in, in the 20th century, Kaji Tetsuro, suggested that the incorporation of this numerology into a calendar simply perceived added value to it, a sort of social value to it, that um, maybe even aggrandized the calendar and made it more legitimate for Chinese users. I think that's a bit reading too much into it. I think this was just Yixing's creativity. Um, it wasn't necessarily so practical, but nevertheless, Yixing was a scientist and he was also interested in collecting more data and creating a more accurate calendar based on data sets. So in 724, and this is recorded in Tongbian and a few other sources, we have figures like Nan Gong Yue um, and others take gnomonic measurements in various locations. Now a gnomon is effectively a pole that you position in the ground and you measure shadows from it. And you take the measurements of the shadows over the course of a year and you'll notice that the length of the shadow changes based on the seasons. Now what's interesting about this expedition is that the Chinese court 
presumably following Ishin's instructions, took these measurements of shadows as far north as they could go and also as far south as modern Vietnam. So they collected all of this data and then he started incorporating some of this data into his own calendar to make it more accurate. Um, he considered the differences in shadow lengths in different regions, but the main flaw I would argue was the lack of spherical Earth cosmology. So Ishii was effectively working with flat Earth cosmology, and that's not because he was a Buddhist monk. So the Buddhists believe in Mount Meru and the four continents, and generally speaking, Buddhists throughout history have rejected um, spherical Earth cosmology. Even if you go into late period Indian Vajrayana, such as the Kala Chakra, they're still operating with these sort of flat earth ideas, even though they're exposed increasingly to um, mathematical Indian astronomy, which uses mathematical proofs and observations to prove that the world is round. But Buddhists, I hate to say it, historically in India as well as in China have been somewhat dogmatic about this, and it was really only in recent centuries that they accepted spherical earth cosmology. But what's really interesting is that um, at the same time Yixing was um, in the capital, is we actually had Indian astronomy translated into Chinese. And so that is the Zhou Zhi Li, um, tentatively reconstructed as Navagraha Purana, although that title is just a tentative reconstruction. And it was produced by Gautama Siddhartha in 718. And it actually defines uh, terrestrial latitude. And so again, this is assuming a spherical Earth cosmology. The actual term in the text is a direct translation, it seems, of Svadesha Aksha. And so Ishii was exposed to these ideas. But he didn't embrace the concept, which I find curious. And what's interesting is that um, also uh, the Siddhartha family accused Ishii after he died of plagiarizing the Jojoli, the Navagraha Purana, although this charge was found to be false, and so Ishii's record was clear. But nevertheless, um, there was other, some, the other things that Ishii looked at, such as the procession of equinoxes. Um, so basically, uh, fixed stars, move at a moderate rate of seven, uh, one degree every 71.6 years. And so if you were looking at the sky at the vernal equinox, or the sol uh, one of the solstices, you would notice over the course of the decades that the actual fixed stars you're looking at move very, very slightly on the same date every year. But you have to wait 71.6 years to observe a full degree. And so the Chinese were aware of this since even before the Han Dynasty, but there was various theories on how long this procession uh, would take. And interestingly, um, a later Ming Dynasty source, um, written by Qing Yun Lu, remembers Yixi for his calculation in a long string of different astronomers. And this is the line here. So, you know, he notes that in the Sui, you have Liu Zhuo, and so he calculated it to be 75 years for one degree to progress um, of axial precession or um, precession of the equinoxes. And then he notes here that Yixi, he calculated the Dayan Li, and he calculated it to be 83 years. And so again, so there's this gradual progression of more accurate, superior um, Chinese astronomical knowledge, and later sources in the Ming Dynasty actually remember Yixi as a monk, but also contributing to the story of um, scientific development. Another major reform that Yixing carried out was to the uh, 28 lunar stations or lunar mansions, which are often equated to nakshetras in the Indian tradition. And there's often been some speculation that this theory of lunar mansions, nakshetras, um, or almanazal in Arabic, all come from a Babylonian source. And so there's been people who have suggested that the Chinese, even in like the Warring States period before the Han Dynasty, somehow had influence from Mesopotamia. But that's not the case because the dimensions of the lunar stations in all these different countries was, were completely different. And you, um, the Chinese discovered the lunar mansions, as did the Indians, independently of one another, just by watching the, the, the movement of the moon, which takes about 28 days to go around the ecliptic. And so you can divide that into 28 stations. But his, but Yixing's main achievement was basically um, having 28 lunar mansions calibrated to the ecliptic and another to the celestial equator, which again was a very um, 
I guess, progressive and also a very scientific approach to taking measurements of the planets. And just to highlight something here, so um, the commentary on the, Maha, on the Vairochana uh, um, Abhisambodhi Sutra also has some details about astronomy. And so again, Yixing is aware of the Indian system, but he also notes here the 27 nakshatras. The Chinese system is Arshaba, it's 28 lunar stations. So Yixing was actually aware that the Indian tradition was different from the Chinese tradition. And he even notes this. And he also um, makes some assumptions here that uh, he says here that you can divide the heavens into 12 chambers, and that's a reference to the zodiac signs, which in this case are Indian, which originally come from Mesopotamia. And then he equates them to Shiratsu, and those are 12 Jupiter stations. So he's also reinterpreting uh, some Indian concepts in a new Chinese context. Basically, synthesization of foreign astronomy is commencing around this period, and Yixing is at the forefront of this development. Um, he also had a reformed definition of the new moon. So for the longest time in, in China, they would define the actual day of the new moon just based on the calendar, because there's 12 months, there's 30 days, and the new moon should be on the first. But if you actually observe the moon, if you actually come out into the field and look at the moon on the first, you might notice that there's a bit of deviation by a day or so. And Yixing proposed that we make it so that the new moon is, is actually precisely scientifically defined. And this is actually a theory that also comes up in his commentary on the sutra. Um, one thing I noticed when I was reading this was that there's a very similar line in the Dayan Li information that's given in the Shintang Shu. So long story short, Yixing is actually um, incorporating some of his astronomical ideas, his calendrical ideas, into um, this Buddhist context. And it's kind of limited. It's also because the practitioners of esoteric Buddhism at the time obviously weren't astronomers and they didn't have enough knowledge of calendrical science to make an argument one way or another. But in any case, we can see this influence from his astronomy coming into his Buddhist work as well. But then it begs the question is how Buddhist was Yixing's astronomy? As I said before, there was an accusation that Yixing plagiarized the Navagraha Purana. I can't actually see that myself. I've actually read all of the data on Yixing's calendar that's available, and I've read the Jyotjali, the Navagraha Purana as well, and I can't really see how Yixing could have plagiarized or borrowed material because they're very different systems. So Yixing's system divides the sky into 365.25 degrees, but the Indian system uses 360 degrees. So the 360 degrees that we still use today, that's a Mesopotamian parameter. The ancient Chinese parameter was 365.25 degrees. So again, Yixing was using a very Chinese system. It's not, there's nothing really Indian about it, and there's really no evident Buddhist influences there either. And so for example, the number theory derived from the Yijing. So I have to argue that Yixing's career as a monk was quite separate from his work as an astronomer. His Buddhist achievements got him the job in the capital. That is to say that he had a career as a Chan monk and also an author on the Vinaya, and then he finally got an invitation to the capital, and then somewhere within a few years he became known for his knowledge of mathematics and astronomy, and then he got the job to reform the state calendar. But we can't really qualify his calendrical science or astronomy as Buddhist, because there's nothing specifically Buddhist about it. And so this is something that somebody criticized my work um, about in 2017. They said, what's so Buddhist about Buddhist astrology apart from the fact that Buddhists are doing it? And we can apply that same sort of criticism here. And the other point I would point out though is that, so Yixing's calendar really wasn't necessarily a part of the Buddhist Sangha or the Buddhist institution either. It was just used by the state to formulate the civil calendar, which everybody used. There was nothing specifically Buddhist about it. Nevertheless, his fame as an astronomer bled into the next century, and then we have all these interesting astrological texts or astromagical texts, such as this one, the Fan Tian Hulu Jiu Yao, which has these very lovely um, icons. So for example, uh, this is the moon, so Chandra, you know, uh, the chariot being pulled by the horses. This is Rahu, the ascending node of the moon. And this is Saturn, who rides a bull, and he's always depicted as, a, as an old man. 
described as a Brahmin. But this sort of iconography only appears in the ninth century, even though the text is attributed to Ishi. And so it was easy to attribute these sort of texts to a past Chinese Buddhist authority on not just astronomy, astronomy but also esoteric um, rituals and so forth. And so this is also the emergence of pseudo Ishi. And I think as historians, we need to make a very strong distinction between the historical man and this later ficta fictitious legend that appears. And so there concludes my discussion. Thank you very much.